open your Bibles to the book of Acts chapter 12, and we are going to be looking at the entirety of the chapter this morning. Again, uh, the book of Acts chapter 12, we'll begin reading uh, in verse 1 through the entirety of uh, the chapter. If I were to ask you to summarize just in, you know, an economy of words, very, very briefly, what is the Bible about? Or what is the theme of the Bible? What's the thrust of the Bible? Uh, we could say something along the lines, it is the, the story, uh, it is the drama of redemption. That, that would be a great way of describing uh, the Bible. Uh, we could say uh, something uh, like it is the testimony of, the testimony to uh, the Lord Jesus Christ, the message of the gospel, the, the message of salvation. But one way that we could speak in summary fashion as to the, the nature, the, the thrust, the, the theme of the Bible, it is the history of kingdoms in conflict. Going all the way back to the earliest chapters of the Bible upon the rebellion of our first parents, Adam and Eve, when God announced, pronounced this curse on our forebears and therefore upon us. He described it as in this fashion that there will be enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. There is the offspring that will come that will be the seed of the woman and there the offspring that are indeed the seed of Satan, the seed of the evil one. And ultimately, the captain of the seed of Satan uh, shall indeed bruise the heel of the king of the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord Jesus, Jesus Christ himself. But really, the Bible, in so many ways, describes, defines, and details the history of the conflict of these two kings and these two kingdoms. And for us, we should know that our king, the king of kings, the king of the ultimate kingdom, shall be victorious. That he has been victorious in his death on the cross and his resurrection from the grave and his ascension to the right hand of the Father to rule and to reign and to one day come back to consummate, to prefer, perfect all that's been accomplished and applied in the growth of that kingdom. But we need to know as well that the conflict, while the victory is sure, the conflict is real that there are people that are harmed in the midst of the conflict. There, there, there is great angst at times over the turmoil and the pain and the affliction and even the persecution that flows out of the reality of the conflict. But I've found in our text today as we work our way through it, one of the great statements, I believe, to be found in the entirety of our Bible. You won't be surprised to find that the first word in the statement is but. That great conjunction that establishes that I, what I'm about to say is going to appear to be and is in reality a contrast between that which has been said and what is about to be said. That is... No matter the evil that opposes the kingdom of Christ, the Word of God increased and multiplied. That the Word of God has gone forth, it is going forth, and it will go forth 
until the King of kings and the Lord of lords appears to claim his church. And so let's look this morning. It, it is uh, sobering in our day to think about the possibilities to reflect on what has happened in the course of history and what seems increasingly possible in our day. But what Luke wrote so long ago as descriptive of the early church is still true today. The Word of God is going to multiply, and it is going to increase. And so let's read this morning, beginning in verse 1 of Acts chapter 12. About that time, Herod the king laid violent hands on some who belonged to the church. He killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And when he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter also. This was during the days of unleavened bread. And when he had seized him, he put him in prison, delivering him over to four squads of soldiers to guard him, intending after the Passover to bring him out to the people. So Peter was kept in prison. But earnest prayer for him was made to God by the church. Now, when Herod was about to bring him out, on that very night, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains, and sentries before the door were guarding the prison. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood next to him, and a light shone in the cell. He struck Peter on the side and woke him, saying, Get up quickly. And the chains fell off his hands. And the angel said to him, Dress yourself and put on your sandals. And he did so, and he said to him, Wrap your cloak around you and follow me. And when he went out, he followed him. And he did not know that what was being done by the angel was real, but thought he was seeing a vision. When they had passed the first and second guard, they came to the iron gate leading into the city. It opened for them of its own accord, and they went out and went along one street, and immediately the angel left him. When Peter came to himself, he said, Now I'm sure that the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me from the hand of Herod and from all that the Jewish people were expecting. When he realized this, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose other name was Mark, where many were gathered together and were praying. When he knocked at the door of the gateway, a servant girl named Rhoda came to answer. Recognizing Peter's voice in her joy, she did not open the gate, but ran in and reported that Peter was standing at the gate. And they said to her, You are out of your mind. But she kept insisting that it was so, and they kept saying, It is an angel, or it is his angel. But Peter continued knocking, and when they opened, they saw him and were amazed. But motioning to them with his hand to be silent, he described to them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison. And he said, Tell these things to James and to the brothers. And then he departed and went to another place. Now, when day came, and there was no little disturbance among the soldiers over what had become of Peter, and after Herod searched for him and did not find him, he examined the sentries and ordered that they should be put to death. Then he went down from Judea to Caesarea and spent time there. Now, Herod was angry with the people of Tyre and Sidon, and they came to him with one accord, having persuaded Blastus, the king's chamberlain. They asked for peace because their country depended on the king's country for food. And on an appointed day, Herod put on his robes and took his seat upon the throne and delivered an oration to them. And the people were shouting, The voice of God and not of man. Immediately an angel of the Lord struck him down because he did not give God the glory, and he was eaten by worms and breathed his last. But the word of God increased and multiplied. And Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem, when they had completed their service, bringing with them John, whose other name was Mark. Pray with me. 
Father, once again, we thank you for your testimony, uh, the testimony of your truth, the testimony that encourages us, that even while we still live in the days of the reality of the conflict between uh, the realm, the kingdom, the king of darkness, and the ultimate, the triumphant king uh, of the kingdom of light, our Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for the certainty of our victory in and through him. I pray that we would live confidently, no matter the providences of our lives, whether they indeed could be sorrowful or whether uh, they could be pleasant, I would pray that we would live in the light, in the experience of the joy of our salvation. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. While I do plan ahead uh, in these sermon series, uh, I didn't exactly plan to uh, hit a really appropriate place for a pause for a few weeks as we uh, do some things uh, related to Christmas next week and we do some things kind of moving forward into the new year. But as I have mentioned on a number of occasions, uh, there are things happening uh, in the book of Acts. Uh, we're getting uh, ready to, uh, we have been transitioning uh, from the apostolic leadership of the original 12, uh, the kind of the center of the church being in Jerusalem. It's going to move out from Jerusalem, and we're soon to see uh, through this one that we saw called and converted back in chapter uh, 9, namely Saul of Tarsus. The gospel is going to go north and west uh, through his efforts. Of course, it's going to go south and east as well. But the New Testament seems primarily concerned with the northward westward uh, movement of the gospel of which you sitting here have benefited from trust me on that one and so we come today and we see here uh, that uh, uh, Luke is going to tell us uh, about some events uh, returning kind of the focus uh, there uh, to Jerusalem and he reminds us of these incredible uh, wicked despots of uh, this one uh, in the uh, murderous, uh, evil family of the Herods or the Herodian dynasty. This one uh, here in verse 1 is one known as Herod Agrippa I. Now, occasionally I can remember in talking to either my brother or my father uh, this is another Somerville talk way of talking, that we would hear of somebody being arrested or getting into some kind of trouble, and we would say something to the effect, well, they've got the bloodline for, for it, uh, meaning uh, they have a long history within that family of managing to stay in trouble. Well, the Herods had quite the bloodline for what you can call bloodlust. Uh, they, they were wicked, they were vile, uh, they, they, they were vicious, their, their evil really knew uh, no boundaries. And so this is the grandson of the Herod that we're introduced to in the birth accounts of Jesus, the one known as Herod uh, the Great. Herod the Great actually murdered his own son, who was the father of the Herod that we see in our text today, Herod Agrippa I, and he and his mother Bernice uh, determined that since this man's grandfather had murdered his own son, it might be wise to leave town. And so they fled to Rome, where uh, this particular Herod lived as... An, for lack of a better term, there's probably better terms, he lived the life of a playboy and there in Rome, and he ran up, ran up debts that he could not pay, and he fled the city, uh, leaving behind uh, his debtors, and he was imprisoned uh, by one Tiberius, one of the Caesars. But upon uh, the death of Tiberius, 
This Herod was freed by Caligula, and he was actually given. Now, sometimes we look at politics today and go cronyism and nepotism and uh, all kinds of ways that we would criticize what goes on in politics, rightly so. Well, there ain't nothing new under the sun, okay? So here's a guy that's uh, been in debt. He's a deadbeat. He's irresponsible, but he's given kind of a governorship. Kind of sounds familiar. Well, I won't even go there. Okay. Now, so he is, he is given kind of the, the, the region around Palestine, and then after the death of Caligula, the emperor Claudius. Now, you remember Claudius appears in Scripture a number of times. He actually expels the Jews from Rome at one point. Well, Caligula, who's kind of a childhood friend, which probably tells you a little bit about his character, is a childhood friend of this Herod, and he's given basically the entirety of the region that his father, Herod the Great, had ruled over. So he has a substantial territory that he rules over, and it is historically correct that the Bibles refer to these Herods as kings, although they ultimately were under the authority of the Caesar in Rome, it could be rightly said that they functioned and were recognized as kings in these uh, particular territories. We're told there in verse 1 that this particular Herod is going to persecute the church, described as he laid violent hands on some who belonged to the church. So whether discriminately or indiscriminately, he is probably entering into the gatherings, uh, arresting leaders. Uh, we're, we're not told exactly how he was doing it, what he, what he was doing, but he was making life difficult for the church. We're, we're told then not only was he uh, violent in a general way against the church, Verse 2, he killed James, the brother of John. Not James, the brother of Jesus, who later becomes the leader of the church. We'll see him in chapter 15. Okay? This is James, son of Zebedee, uh, sons of thunder, uh, who was prominent there in the Jerusalem church. And his manner of death is described as being uh, put to death with the sword. I don't know if that has a particular emphasis uh, in terms of the way he was executed being reflective of uh, the charges being leveled uh, against him. But it's interesting, he's not stoned, he's not crucified, he's either ran through or even possibly uh, beheaded uh, there uh, uh, on the command of Herod. And, and notice there in, in verse 3, uh, his bloodlust was not satisfied. Now, the thing we've got to understand about these uh, appointed, polit about political appointees, imagine that term, okay, those that, that hold political office uh, are beholding to those who appoint them, but they're also beholding to keep the peace among those over whom they have authority. And so, whether it was Pilate, or the previous Herods, or this Herod, or the Herod to, to follow, that would be the Herod that would uh, 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 hold trial uh, with the Apostle Paul later in the book of Acts. They had to figure a way to do what the emperor wanted without inciting a rebellion among the subjects and keeping them happy enough on both ends that the subjects worked and paid taxes so that the king could reap his commission, so to speak, and then pass on to the emperor that which the emperor demanded. And, and so, uh, kind of in general terms, whether it was Pilate or whether it was Herod or whether it was others, they were pragmatist. That is, they, they understood Let's not 
always keep these people in turmoil. Let's not keep them upset. If they're reasonably happy, we leave them alone. Let them do their thing for the most part. They will work. They will prosper. They will pay taxes. I'll be happy. Caesar will be happy. So kind of maintaining the status quo. This particular Herod, while again was grossly immoral, while he was in Jerusalem, he became a rather observant Jew, quote unquote. He was not a Jew. He was an Edomite. He, he was not a, a Jew. But when he was in Jerusalem or in Judea, he behaved pretty well for the most part. So not to, assume, uh, to uh, uh, offend the sensibilities of the Jews. Well, it's one thing to not offend the sensibilities of the Jews. It's quite another to go, wait a minute. They have been very unhappy. You know, they, the, this thing seemed like this, this Christ movement seemed like it might go away, seemed like it wasn't going to be much of a ripple effect. And now they're letting Gentiles in. And, the, and these uh, kind of died in the wool, staunch leaders, the, the, particularly of the Sadducees, they can't stand that. And they're hooping and hollering, and they're causing me trouble. And so he kills James, and they like it. So what's his next move? He arrests Peter while it's unstated with a view toward doing the same thing to Peter that he did uh, to James. And so we see there that he has murdered James. Nothing new for the Herods. Uh, remember, uh, one of the uncles uh, ha has had John the Baptist beheaded. So that, that like I say, they've got the bloodline uh, for all of this. Uh, he's playing to his base. You ever heard that when you hear politics talk, talked about? This politician is playing to their base. Uh, he's doing this, that, or the other, or not doing this, that, or the other, to curry favor uh, among the, uh, the electorate. So they seize Peter, and maybe they had heard about his previous escape, but they assigned four squads of soldiers. That's 16 men to guard one prisoner. Uh, probably two chained to him, uh, two, cha two at various doors, uh, probably two rotations of eight or something like that where they could guard him uh, around the clock. And so uh, what you uh, see here then is on one hand, James receiving that which he said he could do. Remember when mama comes and asks of Jesus, hey, my boys are good boys. They're good boys. Don't you think they deserve these high positions in the kingdom? And, and James and John weren't innocent in that. Jesus asked them what? Can you drink of my cup? Indeed, you will. And James did and, and drank it courageously. And so we see here a picture, really, of these two kingdoms. Look there again in verse 5. So Peter was kept in prison. And that's the end of the story. That's it. It's all over. Leader of the church is in prison. We might as well quit and go home. Nothing we can do. They're the state. They're the government. They got us. We quit. But but Earnest prayer for him was made to God by the church. Now that word earnest there, the Greek is ektenos. Ektenos. It is used in Luke twenty-two forty-four, 44 of describing the way that Jesus prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane when he sweated sweat drops of blood in his agony. What am I saying? That the church got serious about prayer. And so in, in, in looking at this, we see the two realms, the two kingdoms. 
We see the two kings. We see Satan and Christ. We see the two representatives. We see Peter and Herod. We see the two weapons, the power of the sword, the power of coercion, and we see the power of prayer. Which is more powerful, the power of the sword or the power of prayer? I think y'all can answer that one. Okay, thank you, thank you. I'm glad somebody. We see two deaths. We see James. We see Herod. In a minute we will. Two destinies, heaven and hell. Two outcomes. James is well remembered. It takes some of you narrow-minded, fundamentalist, Bible-thumping Baptists to know who Herod was, okay? And so I think, you know, just as an aside, kind of goes along with this, one of the great lines that I've ever heard when you think about history and how history remembers people, we name our sons Paul, we name our dogs Nero, okay? If that informs you any, of anything about how history remembers those who align themselves with the kingdom of darkness. And so, Peter is in prison, but the church has not given up. They are praying. And so what are we going to see, beginning in verse 6? Another, it just gets boring, doesn't it? Another miraculous escape from prison. Okay? Peter is going to be delivered. I suppose Herod knew something about the previous escape, and so he ain't going to get away this time. We're going to double down on the guard, and we will be sure that he stays. Now, I don't want to get caught up in, in, in the details, and, and I don't know about y'all, but there's at least a couple of, it, it's kind of comical when I read it, I don't know, maybe I just look at things weird. And, and, and it, was, it was noted Wednesday night in, in prayer meeting, they're praying for his release, and then when he shows up at the door, they're shocked. Imagine that. So, but one of the interesting things, you remember the night in the garden and Jesus rebuke to the disciples, could you not watch and pray with me one hour? You're asleep. I'm praying. I'm in agony, you're sleeping. So knowing that, what would we expect Peter to do while he's sitting there in prison? To be fervently praying, God, deliver me from this prison. Set me free. Empower the church. Allow me to preach your word. I, all of it, wouldn't you? What's he doing? They hadn't invented CPAPs back then. He was snoring. Y'all didn't know. That's not, in the, that's not in the English. It's in the Greek. Okay? He was sleeping. He, he was sleeping. And, and listen, he was, he was, all of us have fallen asleep on the floor or in a chair or something like that. I hope none of you fall asleep in your driver's seat of your car, but I'm sure some, some of you probably have at some point. But, um, you know, you go to sleep, in an uncomfortable position and just the slightest little and you wake up now i don't know if they had his perfect sleeper there in the prison with him uh i don't imagine he was real comfortable but he wasn't resting on a perfect sleeper he was resting in the certainty of his God and his Savior. And he was so sound asleep that the light, you know, the light didn't even wake him off. The angel had to come in and go, hey boy. It's like my daddy when he used to come in on Saturday morning. It's time to go to work. Hey, get up. Yeah. He had to wake him up, had to rouse him out of a deep sleep. Now why, why could he, I mean, do you not, and, and here's, this is one of the dangers sometimes of proof texting your Bible. We always should be praying. Yeah. But we always should be resting in the certainty of the goodness of God. 
And so I can imagine. Now, I don't think Peter had read Jerry Bridges' book, The Discipline of Grace, yet. Oh, he should have. It's a good book. Now, and, and you'll hear me refer to it many, many times, the various principles. One of Jerry Bridges' principles, preach the gospel to yourself. When you're anxious, when you're in trouble, when things are difficult, when, 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 when you think all is lost, preach the gospel to yourself. And you can always begin with something like this. For whom did Christ die? He died for sinners like me. And for that I give thanks. But I believe he also knew some other things. He, he knew that what Jesus had taught on the Sermon on the Mount, that he should not be anxious to add one second to his life. Why worry and lose sleep when that is determined by God, he, that his days have been numbered while he was in his mother's womb, and Herod had nothing to do with it. He knew that he was a sheep that had heard the voice of the good shepherd, and that no one was ever going to snatch him out of his Savior's hand. He knew that the church was going to be built. Now, with him or without him, but the church was going to be built. That God was going to work all things for his good, for God's glory, for the establishment of that church. And you know what? Maybe like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Hey, king, we ain't bowing, do your best, our God can deliver us, but even if he don't, our God is faithful. And maybe long before Paul wrote it down, Peter said, to be absent from the body, to be present with the Lord. And he went ahead and sung a verse, it is well with my soul. And so, Peter preached the gospel to himself he rested in the sweet sovereignty of God over all things and when the angel finally gets him awake he says hey dummy put your clothes on we're going somewhere okay he gets dressed he follows him out now it's interesting when he's delivered the first time he goes to the temple to preach when Paul is released he and Silas just sit there and sing and praise and help, and help the jailer. This time, Peter goes to the mother of John Mark's house, Mary, and begins knocking on the door. And Rhoda shows up. Kind of interesting they mention her name. You know, Rhoda wouldn't have done real well at North Clay, would she? Do you, do you think she might have got poked a little fun at here? All you gentle, sweet souls out there. She, she might have got just a smidge of ridicule. That, hey, Peter shows up. He's standing at the door knocking. You know it's him, and you leave him standing at the door. And, of course, the whole crowd didn't even believe him or believe her. And so they went out. They brought him in. He instructed them. And then, did he go to the temple to preach like he had done before? No. Verse 17 says what? God's providence. Peter, you need to move to another place. Your time to stand and fight, your time uh, to be martyred is not now. You're going to leave. And so, obviously, when it's discovered the next morning, when they're getting ready to bring him forth, probably to some type of... Uh, kangaroo uh, court to be executed they find that he's gone they keep looking they quiz the sentries they inquire and you see what happened they put those sentries to death that's why probably when 
the Philippian jailer thought that Paul and Silas had escaped, he was ready to kill himself because he knew what? He knew that the penalty for losing a prisoner was death. And so, why in one case they spare the Philippian jailer? These others suffer their fate. Why in one case stay and preach? Other case, stay and go. Or go. And so, we have to be careful sometimes going to our one special text. I, one of my favorite quips from one of my favorite football coaches. Y'all remember Steve Spurrier or Steve Superior, as I like to refer to him? He, 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 do y'all know that his father was a preacher? Steve, Steve Spurrier. First time I ever heard of him. Now, if you're really old, you'll know what I'm talking about. We used to get a thing in Sunday school called the Sunday Picks. And it was a little, like a uh, comic book of Bible stories. It's where I first heard of Paul Anderson. If you don't know who, you, who he is, Google him. Fran Tarkington, what a disappointment. But Steve Spurrier's testimony was in there. And so I always remembered Steve Spurrier. But he said, you know, my father was a New Testament Christian. And he was, you know, love your neighbor, love your enemies, turn the other chick. Cheek. I'm more of an Old Testament Christian. Kill the Amalekites. And so I thought, you know, that's the danger of proof texting. They're both in the Bible, aren't they? So again, sometimes it's hard when we say, well, this is what the Bible's. Sometimes the Bible is not saying this is what you do. The Bible is saying this is what happened. Okay? So let's be careful there. All right, let's move forward. We see another mysterious death. It's funny. It's actually not. People occasionally drop dead in the Bible. And God's right in the middle of it. And I'm amazed at the people that trifle with God. God's a good guy. He's, he gets me. He understands. You know, well, it's me. And my circumstances are special. And I'm going to get off the hook. And I mean, you know, you, you, you've got certainly in the Old Testament, Lot's wife and her disobedience and uh, Aaron's sons, Nadab and Abihu, and even here in the book of Acts, who have you got? Ananias and Sapphira. And so here you've got one that's not even nominally a part of the believing community, this one, Herod. Look there in verse 20. Herod is described as being angry with the people of Tyre and Sidon. This region was not directly under his authority, okay? Uh, he had a, a large territory, but it did not include Tyre or Sidon. But his territory was kind of a breadbasket, and so they sold food to Tyre and Sidon. And something went sideways. Uh, somebody didn't pay their bills, or somebody complained, or who knows. But it says Herod uh, was angry, and they realized, the people of Tyre and Sidon, we're dependent. We're dependent on his benevolence. And so they persuaded someone in Herod's inner circle, uh, Blastus, who's described as his chamberlain, to ask uh, for peace. Again, why? Because we're starving to death. We're dependent on his benevolence for uh, food. And we're told in verse 21 that at a particular time, on the appointed day, he shows up with all pomp and circumstance to deliver a speech, uh, most likely to communicate his great benevolence and once again providing for them their sustenance. Well, Josephus records it this way. When Herod entered the theater clad in a glittering silver garment, his flatterers addressed him as God. May you be propitious to us. And if we have hitherto feared you as a man, yet henceforth we agree that you're more than a mortal in your being. The king accepted their flattery. Then looking upward, he saw an owl perched on a rope 
and took it as a symbol of ill fortune. At the same time, he was seized by violent internal pains and was carried into his palace where he died after five days of illness. And so he suffered greatly. Now, our text describes it, verse 23, this way. He's receiving the accolades. The voice of God, not of man. Yeah, bring it on. Keep on. Yeah, I like that. Yeah, come on. And immediately an angel of the Lord did what? Struck him down. Okay? Struck him down. Why? Because he did not give God the glory that God was due. He accepted the accolades of actually being a God. Now, hard to know exactly how this went down. The angel killed him. He got eaten by maggots. Simple enough. That's the way it goes. Uh, some, and, and you know, this is kind of a popular thing, uh, think that what went on here uh, was a, a particular type of tapeworm. And the Greek here is, is a derivative of the word scolax. And this tapeworm, which is just uh, voraci voraciously replicates itself can actually form these huge cysts uh, inside your abdomen, uh, on your liver, and your intestines, whatever, and they'll get so big, now in summer we say bust, okay, but they would burst, okay, they would break open, and of course all kinds of poisons and terrible things would happen, and, and then the worms would keep multiplying, and they would continue to eat. It, this is the same word that you see when Jesus describes hell as the place where the worm dieth not, okay? And so it's hard to know exactly what happened is um, did God use a natural type phenomenon which was common in the ancient world? It's still very common in third world countries, these types of tapeworms, okay? They're a real problem for people that don't have proper hygiene, okay? And whether it was just something that, that grew in him and finally ruptured and killed him, or whether God directly intervened, called him to give an account, and the natural processes uh, took over. Now again, kingdoms in conflict. Herod is the man. Peter's in prison. Peter's set free. Herod's dead. You get the kind of the, the, the order there? It, it, it looked like for all the world, who, who would you have bet on when James is killed with the sword? But God's people earnestly, fervently prayed. It's amazing. And I don't have time to detail all of this. But there are things that always go hand in hand. The right preaching of the Word of God and the fervent prayer of the people of God and then the activity of God to sanctify His people and to save those who aren't His people, to bring them into the kingdom. And so... Herod's been eaten by worms, the, the, the representative of that kingdom of darkness. And, and you know, it's, it's a good question. Well, if, if you're going to kill one wicked, violent, vicious, vile despot, why not kill them all? Why, why let history run its course? I mean, Caligula is going to be replaced by Nero, and he will kill Paul and Peter. And he will do great violence to the church. Why, why let any of them come to power? And you can go down the course of history. But history is real. And the conflict is real. But the victory is certain because verse 24 is true. The Word of God will be proclaimed upon earth. His kingdom will be advanced. I will build my church. The gates of hell, the sword of Herod, will never, ever.
prevail. And so, it's interesting, maybe to ask, maybe it's interesting, may not be a good idea. Why does James die and Peter live? I'm told God is sovereign and God has his purpose. And his ways are not our ways. His ways are higher. He's got ways that are secret that we don't understand. And we simply have to trust him. Whether we experience the sword or the angel of deliverance. We're reminded in, in this conflict, and I've told you, I listen to things sometimes and I want to fight. I mean, I want to wring somebody's neck. I mean, I want to put my foot on somebody's neck and just, just give it a... Now, I never was a smoker, but I've seen smokers take and put that cigarette on the ground and do that bit right there. That's what I want to do sometimes. Paul says we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. But they're unseen, evil, spiritual forces. They're in high places. Now, there's a reality that those spiritual forces manifest themselves in the flesh and blood. And they advance the, they advance the causes of those unseen spiritual forces. But just the same, it is a spiritual battle. And we have not been assigned to advance our cause by way of the sword. In fact, any time the church has tried that, they have been met with frustration. But when they're dependent upon the Word, when they're dependent upon the Spirit, they see the church flourish no matter who wields the sword. And so Paul can say in 2 Corinthians 10 that the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but they are powerful. To demolish strongholds by whoever the Herods are in whatever day they exist. As I mentioned, and, and sometimes I think in my appropriate biblical emphasis upon the sovereignty of God, sovereign in your salvation, sovereign in the providences of our lives, that you would think, well, it's a game. It's not real. It's just some kind of fake drama. No, no. You make real decisions. There are real consequences. Evil occurs in the world, does great damage. It's, it's, it's real. And, 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 and sometimes you look and, and why? Why all the travesty? Why all the, the terrible violence? Why all of these horrible things that you, you see each and every day? Whether, whether locally, whether nationally, or whether worldwide. Just atrocities everywhere. And I'm convinced, again... The Word of God is going to go forth. It's going to multiply, even in a world like that. And it, it reminded me, I was, I was kidding one of our young ladies Wednesday night, said her husband had to work late, said he was an engineer. And I'm like, why has he got to work late? It's just straight lines and stuff. I'm, I mean, 6, 8, 10, that's all you got to do. It's, it's square. I mean, can't be that hard. High school trig, folks. Go back and look at it. But I'm reminded of how bad an attitude I had about being involved with building. Because usually I had a shovel or a pick or at best a hammer just nailing subflooring down. Or something. I never got the big picture. I never was the architect. I never was the contractor. I was just kind of a grunt, just keeping my head down, trying to not get in trouble. Just trying to make it through the day. And sometimes we don't understand that indeed, like Abraham, we're looking for that city whose architect and builder is God. And sometimes we don't appreciate that in building that ultimate and final city, there's a lot of us grunts that we're down here and we don't exactly get it. But when the product is finished, it will be glorious. And it will reflect that the kingdom of the seed of the woman has triumphed and the means has been that the word of God increased and multiplied and it will never, ever stop. Let's pray. Father, we thank you.
for your truth. Your truth is your word. It is for us. Uh, you, you explain things to us. You reveal yourself to us. Sometimes you don't tell us everything that we would like to know. But you've tell, told us everything you want us to know for the good of our soul, for the, our hope of heaven, for the ability to live in what sometimes is a, a crushingly cruel world with the hope of the certainty of the triumph of your kingdom. May we be found faithful in Jesus' name. Amen.